What do we know about the UCF Golden Knights, and what do we know about TCU? We have a special guest to help us with that here on Locked On Horn Frogs, your team every day. You are Locked On Horn Frogs, your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You heard the voice over there, your team every day. Subscribe on YouTube, also on your favorite podcast platform. I think I made a snafu in the intro here. Adam, one thing I've learned this week, yeah. UCF, they have a, a – you guys got a great fan base. Like, I've gotten a lot of interaction with people. It's not Golden Knights anymore, is it? Is it just the Knights? No. Uh, this happens a lot, Steve. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. B, this happens a lot where I get on a show and I get introduced and I get introduced as the Golden Knights. And I'm like, hey, we're off to a bad fit already. I want to be friends with you, but we're not the Golden Knights anymore. 2007, we dropped that. So you are correct. It's just the UCF Knights at this point. But you seem like a nice guy, so I'm going to let this one slide. But you are correct. A good self-correction on your part is the UCF Knights. Well, I appreciate the grace. That's, uh, that's good stuff <laughs> there. We're happy to have Adam with us. Uh, I'm excited about this game. Like, I, I've been saying – throughout the week I feel like this is a prove it game for both teams you know I, I, both teams are doing some things really well but it's been against competition that is not the best they're going to see all year I wanted to start with KJ Jefferson when he became available in the offseason there was a brief window of time where people were talking about him in TCU but it was really just kind of a lazy like hey Kendall Bryles used to coach this guy it would make sense if he made this move what was your thought process, I guess, during that recruitment? And what have you been your kind of your initial impressions of him as a quarterback for this team? Yeah, look, I think initially, right, like you look at the body type, you look at the pedigree. And, and uh, to your point, a lot of people laid late, made lazy comparisons to, to Cam Newton, right? Gus Malzahn famously coached Cam Newton. You see a big, strong quarterback who can run the football. We automatically said, this is the next Cam Newton. This is going to fit perfect, right? So I think at the time, UCF was going to toss it between KJ Jefferson and Grayson McCall. They both came to Orlando, both did visits. McCall ended up um, heading to NC State. So KJ kind of became the, the choice by a, a, some default. Now, UCF would tell you that he was always their first choice, so believe what you want about that. But So, yeah, initially, you, know, like, you, you look at the prototype, you look at what Gus Malzahn's done offensively in the past, and you can see the fit, right? So that was that was preseason. That, that, looked, that looked good. I will tell you, you know, Stephen, week one against New Hampshire, not a great opponent. KJ did not look good. He looked uncomfortable. A couple of, of really bad throws, a head scratching interception. He had a viral moment where the ball just slipped out of his hands in a fumble. He just did not look comfortable, and he had a lot of fans worried after week one around. Okay, what did what did we really get here? Uh, week two, he cleaned it up a little bit uh, against Sam Houston State. Uh, played a little bit better, but UCF hasn't asked him to do much just yet. Um, and so I think that's kind of the big unknown: is what do we have here? I think. I think the fans early on thought we've got a quarterback who can come in and win us some games, right? Make some big throws, make some big plays, win us some games. After two weeks, the sentiment is, hey, maybe he's just better not losing us games. And so I, I don't think we know what we have yet. I think this week, uh, you know, coming to Fort Worth will be a big test. But I think it was really exciting. Week one got a little bit, uh, a little bit damp. Week two got a little bit better. So I, I think there's still some, some mixed feelings in terms of what KJ will bring to UCF. Well, that leads me well into my next thought because I know they have the number one rushing offense in the nation right now, and Gus has always been a guy that does really creative things in the run game, and that's he wants to commit to that. You talked about Cam. Obviously, he was a, a different type of player. I mean, he was the number one overall draft pick, but uh, with R.J. Harvey, and I know they have some backs behind him that they like as, as change of pace type guys, do you think they want to run the ball this much? Like, is this going to be their identity, or do you just feel like this was – hey, we can kind of do what we want against these two teams on the ground, and there's no need to really show much else to anyone on tape about what this passing game could look like. Yeah, no, I think they want to run the ball. I think, you know, for all of, you know, what people think about Gus Malzahn, to your point, at his core, he, he's a guy who wants to run the football, right? He wants a physical running game. Um, and, and here's what I tell you about UCF's rushing attack. They, they have a stable of running backs. You mentioned probably that the first running back that you'll hear about is R.J. Harvey. 1,400 yards last year. He's already off to a great start this year. I think he's eighth in the nation in rushing yards, second in rushing touchdowns. So he's off to a great start this year. He was by far the RB1 for UCF. He's, he's a hometown hero. He's a legend there. You know, that, that guy can do no wrong. Then UCF goes in the portal and pick up Miles Montgomery from uh, from Cincinnati. Again, a guy who got some some touches at Cincinnati, but didn't get, didn't get a, a lot of touches. And 
this shit we were kind of like, okay, that's interesting. Like, how's he fit in here? But, but that's fine, right? So, you know, we got Miles Montgomery. We already had Johnny Richardson, who was another kind of Swiss Army knife back that coming back from UCF. And then late in the spring, we pick up Penny Boone, who came from, uh, I think it was Kent State, spent the spring at Louisville, and then came to UCF. He had 1,400 yards in the MAC last year. Him and RJ Harvey both had over 1,400 yards. And we all scratched our head, like, what, what's Gus doing with all these running backs? Like, there's only one football, as far as I know. How are we going to get touches for all these guys? And I think the answer is just what you said. I think he wants to commit to running the football. And if somebody stubs a toe and somebody's out, he wants to have a stable of backs he can just turn around to and say, okay, now you're up, now you're up, now you're up. I think last year UCF had RJ Harvey, and he was good. Um, but after that, it, there, was a, there was a bit of a drop-off at times. I think he's loaded up in the backfield because he wants to commit to running the football. And if someone's not having the, an off night, someone gets you know, dinged up uh, he wants to be able i think to turn to a lot of different guys and say okay you're in so i think you're going to see a commitment to run the football the, the challenge is going to be you know will a defense at some point you know just dare ucf and kj to throw the football and when they do how successful will they be at that but i think i don't think this is an act after two weeks i think this is what gus wants to do he wants to use those four running backs. We call them Mount Rush Four at UCF right now. Uh, he wants to use those four running backs, I think, and, and really kind of ball control, pound the rock, and then find opportunities for KJ to make some plays in the passing game. With RJ Harvey specifically, I feel like I saw maybe on like a jet sweep he got the football. Are they trying to move him around the formation? Is it really more just your prototypical like downhill stuff? Uh, I just felt like I saw him in a few different spots, and I know Gus likes to do some window dressing pre-snap are, are they moving him around or is it more you're like hey we're just handing the ball off letting him find space and kind of get after it with his athleticism yeah they haven't moved him around much honestly i mean D gus does do a lot of jet sweeps which you may have seen was um wide receiver xavier townsend takes a lot of jet sweeps i think he had over 50 yards rushing against uh, sam houston state just on jet sweeps alone um so they don't move him around much typically rj is also the wildcat quarterback so you know, UCF will go to that wildcat, take the quarterback off the field formation. Uh, R.J. Harvey was a previous quarterback at Virginia before he came to UCF, so he's got some experience there. So he will often be kind of that wildcat quarterback. But Gus is pretty consistent, puts him in the backfield. And what you'll see with R.J. is he's a really patient runner. I think the comparison a lot of people make is to Le'Veon Bell, if those remember the Pittsburgh Steelers running back from back in the day. Very patient runner, will kind of dance in the backfield, wait for the crease to open up, and then, you know, hit the crease and, and hit it hard. That's kind of been a bit of his running style. Now, I will tell you this and I don't know what will happen here, but Gus has been hinting in his last couple of media availabilities that you might see some of these guys on the field at the same time. We did not see that in week one or week two. We only just saw one at a time. So to your point earlier, maybe that means he's going to try something different with a with an RJ and a, and a Miles Montgomery on the field at the same time. You know, maybe one of them's, you know, obviously – in a, in a blocky position, who knows? So I, I do think you may see a wrinkle like that. We haven't seen that yet, but Gus has been talking about that impressor, so I wouldn't be surprised if at some point he doesn't break that out. Coming up next, we'll flip sides and talk about the UCF defense and TCU and UCF, uh, new defensive scheme, so we'll get into that here on Locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day. I do want to briefly talk about factor meals. Uh, if you're like me and you got four kids running around, the most stressful part of the day in my house is between like 5 and 7 p.m. trying to get everybody fed. And then you get done and you get everybody in bed and you're like, wait, I haven't eaten anything. And so that can be like, oh, gosh, now i got to cook. Now i got to find something to eat. But Factor Meals makes it easy for you because they're already prepped and they're good for you, too. So you don't have to worry about what's in this. Is this just going to make me feel worse? 35 different meals and more than 60 add-ons to choose from every week. Crush your wellness goals with dietitian approved ingredients that you can trust. Make your day delicious. Say at breakfast. Uh, lunch, dinner, and dessert, and their uh, nutritious options. Head to factormeals.com slash college 50 and use code college 50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month. Again, that code is college 50 at factormeals.com slash college 50 You get half off your first month and then 20% off the next month. We appreciate Factor Meals and their sponsorship of the Lockdown Network. We also appreciate our friends at FanDuel. If you've ever wondered, Man, I would love to experience NFL Sunday ticket, watching out-of-market games. They have a promotion going on right now through September 22nd, so you're running out of time, but you still do have time to put one $5 bet down, and through YouTube TV, you can get a three-month free trial of NFL Sunday ticket. With a YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season, Sunday afternoon, out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment. If you're a Cowboys fan because you're a masochist like me, you can watch the Cowboys wherever you are on YouTube TV. Again, that is uh, FanDuel, FanDuel app. They are the official sponsor of the Lockdown Network and the official betting partner 
of the NFL. So defensively, we were talking a little bit off air, uh, Adam. TCU's defense was a disaster last year. They had Joe Gillespie, who, I mean, is a good dude, but it, it didn't work, and they were giving up a ton of points. So they, in the offseason, they made a move. They go get Andy Avalos, who was the head coach at Boise before that didn't work out. And the early returns have been solid. I mean, again, we, we talked about kind of the competition level, but they're a lot more aggressive. They're blitzing a lot more. What is your impression early on of this UCF defense? What do you think their biggest strength has been so far this season? Yeah, very similar to, to what you just described, Stephen. UCF did the same. They went out and got Ted Roof, who's been, I think, at 14 schools in the last 13 years uh, to, to coordinate the defense. Obviously, a, a veteran D coordinator, somebody Gus Malzahn knew very well. Uh, so he's come in and kind of brought a new style. What you're hearing from the players is they're going to be more aggressive. They're going to be attacking style defense. I think a lot of folks will tell you last year, UCF just kind of sat back and they were sort of bend, don't break and sort of, sort of hope they make plays. Um, this this team thus far, they've been way more aggressive. Um, they've definitely been a little bit more assertive on the defensive side. They forced, you know, more turnovers, I think, in the first two games than they did through the first, like, half half of the season last year. So they've definitely been a more aggressive defense. I would say the biggest thing they did, Stephen, and it sounds silly, but, I mean, and this is probably going to come back to bite me because I'm going to say it'll, it'll, it'll change. They've been very sound in the tackling game. That's something UCF struggled with the last year was, was literally getting humans onto the ground. Uh, and this year they've been much more um they're much they're much more aggressive with that they brought in a ton of transfers so this entire defense is basically revamped save for maybe three guys last year who were still starting that were there it's an entirely new defense um so it's it's a new style and what you've seen so far is you've seen them be attacking you're gonna see some names like the sean pace who uh, came over from Cincinnati, um, a, a, a smaller build linebacker. I think he's only 220 pounds, but kid flies around. Anytime there's a, there's a, there's a tackle, there's a pile. Just look at the pile. The number three for UCF will be getting off that pile because he seems to be around the ball at all times. Another linebacker, Ethan Barr, um, he came from Vanderbilt. Veteran kid has been around, I think, five, six years now. So he, he knows, he knows defense, played under Ted Roof. So he knows that system really well, too. So those two linebackers specifically have been great additions for UCF. But I think you'll see a more attacking style of defense. I think you'll see some more blitzing. And I think you'll see, um, you know, a, a team that I think is, is overall faster on defense. Uh, and, and has been sure-handed in tackling. So we'll see if that can materialize on, on Saturday in, in, uh, in Fort Worth. This Knights O-line, uh, when I was watching them, I was like, man, they're really big. And then I looked at the measurables. I said, okay, yeah, my eyes were right. Like, this is a really big offensive line. I think got a couple transfers. Also a tackle that's like 6'10". Um, they haven't been asked to do a lot of pass protection, but I, I'm assuming they've been okay so far. Like, how have they handled KJ being in the pocket and throwing the football? Yeah, it's interesting. I think they've gotten a little bit of uh, – so I, I would say they're much better in the run game than they are the pass game, right? I think KJ's had a little bit of pressure. It's really tough to tell because KJ, I think, is still not comfortable fully in this offense. So, And there's some times that he looks at a read – feels a little bit of pressure and takes off and it's hard to tell like okay did he not stick in that long enough or was the o-line kind of breaking down i will tell you though this is a, a unit that so these five individuals have been at ucf uh for at least now three years i think if you add in uh, amari kite who was a transfer from alabama so they've been together for a while but this is the first configuration of this five some other guys with flop positions caden kittler is a, is a first year starter at center so there's still some newness there uh ucf fans adore um, o-line coach herb hand a veteran in the in the industry He's been around a long time, does a really good job coaching O-line. And they ask a lot of this O-line. Gus's offense, while very simplistic in some respects, they ask a lot of that offensive line. So that'll be a key for, for UCF. I think this has been an area that's struggled the last couple of seasons. You know, every year we hear that they have the, the right mix. To your point, they've been pretty dominant in the first two games. You mentioned off the top, leading the nation, rushing for 19 yards average per game. You don't do that with a bad O-line, even though you're not playing great opponents uh, potentially. So I think there's some talent there, but – I don't think they've been tested, but they're going to be tested on Saturday. All right. So night game in Fort Worth. Adam, what are your keys to this ball game for UCF if they're going to uh, come into town and try to pull off a victory? Yeah, I think first and foremost, they got to protect the football, right? I, I think KJ's had uh, a couple of head-scratching interceptions the last two games. Uh, you know, and that that can't happen, right? We can't give the ball away. So KJ has got to be got to be smart with with the passing game. I think obviously the running game has to click, and I think it will in some respects. But it's going to come down to when TCU, when Andy Avalos, who by the way coached Boise State last year, UCF played at Boise, so Andy's oh, going to know Gus's system a little bit, right? So there's it's not going to be like, oh my goodness, what is this offense? There's going to be some keys there. You mentioned offensive coordinator Kendall Bryles knows KJ really well, right? So there's a lot of familiarity between between these staffs and what they do. So at some point. 
they're going to put, you know, eight, nine in the box and say, go ahead, KJ, give, give it a throw. And I think it's going to be his ability to step up in those big moments and make the throws. I think the UCF running game will, will get it. will get its own. I don't think we'll get 419, but I, th- I think it'll get its own. It's going to come down to can KJ make a throw when he has to. And then defensively, you know, can they continue to be, you know, a sound attacking defense, right? I think that this has been a defense that's been opportunistic with turnovers. Can they keep that? Can they keep that up? I don't think they've seen the speed they're going to see with TCU. Um, and so can they keep that up? You know, can they continue to maintain that? And really, last but not least, is can they keep their composure? UCF has not been great on the road the last couple of seasons under Gus Malzahn. Penalties have been an issue at times. Um, head scratching, delay of games, right? I'm willing to take a, a PI penalty, right? That's a judgment call at some point, right? I'm willing to take a holding penalty, right? Quasi judgment call. But UCF has shot themselves in the foot with false starts, with delay of games, with too many men on the field. So can they keep their composure? Can they be composed and actually run the operation well? So if, if UCF's hitting those keys, I think you got to feel good if you're a UCF fan about them potentially coming out with a win. Man, these teams are similar. I mean, I feel like the attention to detail and the focus penalties have been an issue. Really, last year they were. In game two, TCU cleaned it up a little bit. But, yeah, Sunny Dyke struggled with that uh, last season, and it was it was frustrating to watch. Well, I feel like it's going to be a good football game. I feel good about TCU at home. I think Josh Hoover's playing well, and uh, they might just have a few more weapons. But I feel like both teams are really talented. And, honestly, I think it's going to be, like a lot of games in the Big 12, probably you know comes down to one or two possessions that could make the difference. But, Adam, I know you're at Sons of UCF on Twitter. You guys are really active in posting content and uh, putting stuff out on social media. A live show tomorrow night that I'm, I'm going to be a part of, which will be fun. Uh, where else can Horn Frog fans find you? What's the best way that they can get that podcast in their feed this week? Yeah, so anywhere you get downloadable content, you can you can find Sons of UCF. We also have all all of our audio stuff is also on video as well. So go to our YouTube channel at Sons of UCF. All the videos, the live show that Stephen you're going to be on next week or this week rather, that'll be on video on YouTube. So go to Sons of UCF at YouTube, and then for web content, SonsUCF.com is where you can uh, read some articles, some game recaps as well. Uh, we cover football, basketball, basically all the sports. So if you need some UCF stuff for for this or down the road, um, Sons of UCF has you covered. Adam, thank you for doing this for us. We appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Stephen. I'll come back and wrap things up after this. It's Locked On Horn Frogs. You're- if you need to hire somebody, there's only one place you should go, and it's LinkedIn. It's pretty simple. Why? Because everybody looking for work is using LinkedIn. It's the number one job board. 70% of folks that are on LinkedIn, they're not looking anywhere else. They're exclusively looking for work on LinkedIn.com. You go to LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College and post your job for free which is great. We all love free things. Again, that's linkedin.com slash lockdown college. They have uh, really cool tools um, that are AI based that help you sort out applications and resumes, so that you're not having to go through every single person that applies. There's also screening questions that allow you to say, okay, this person is probably not a good fit. 86% of small businesses rate LinkedIn as the number one place where they find help. Uh, you can't mess around with your business. It's the culture fit is going to be huge. You have to find people to keep it churning and moving at the right pace. LinkedIn.com slash Locked On College. We thank LinkedIn for their sponsorship of the Locked On Network. Well, that was fun. Adam Eaton from Sons of UCF. Appreciate him hopping on the show today. My baseball people, I could Google this, but I'm too lazy right now. It's on my mind. Adam Eaton, he played for like the White Sox and the Angels, right? Back in the day, like that was a, that was a guy, I'm not losing my mind here, Adam Eaton. When I heard that name, I thought, man, that sounds familiar. And I feel like I finally put it together, but uh, not the same person, but we still loved having Adam on the show. Good perspective there. Um, it was interesting to hear him because most UCF fans that I've encountered so far have been super confident about this game, which I understand. I mean, they're playing well, and I know you know fans typically are like, hey, I want to have a reason to be fired up. Um, he sounded more cautiously optimistic about where UCF is and where they could go throughout the rest of this year. But I think there's a lot of talent on that football team, and they recruited a high level, and they they were heavy in the transfer portal this year, which really helped them. But TCU is also very talented, and I feel like the, the teams are very similar, as I've sort of laid out over the last few days. I think keys-wise keys for the Frogs, and I'll talk more in depth about this on Friday, but again, with the turnover battle, you just have to find a way to win. And then getting pressure on KJ Jefferson and making him throw the football. And I know they've got some good wide receivers, but if this team's going to beat you, 
force them to do it in a way that's not their identity, which is going to be running the ball and getting big plays on the ground. Um, I know KJ's an experienced guy. He's had over 50 starts, I think Sonny Dyke said in his career, but I want to put pressure on him. And so it's a huge week for Andy Avalos, who has familiarity with Gus Malzahn, as we talked about in, in the first couple segments of the show, but understanding and diagnosing that offense. Um, and I, I said this yesterday, I think this is a big week for Dana Holgerson in showing, okay, why did Sonny Dykes bring you on staff? Because he's supposed to work specifically with the defense on advanced scouting of these different offensive schemes. So hopefully he has this defensive staff really prepared for a lot of the pre-snap motion and the things that UCF is going to try to do to confuse this defense. And guys can, with that, play with their instincts and get downhill and make plays. Be physical. Your front seven's going to be huge. Um, it's just a big-time game for them to meet you know, these ball carriers at the point of attack, get them on the ground, and not allow them to get extra yardage. R.J. Harvey's really athletic. Um, K.J. Is, is just a big dude who can run, but looks shaky in the first two games at times. So putting pressure on him, forcing him to be in uncomfortable situations can be really beneficial for this TCU team. Uh, content or a reaction wise from our audience, Tebow says, I'm glad we have these guys at home. Go frogs. Yeah. I think that's a huge factor. I'm super excited about the atmosphere for a night game. I know it's going to be a blackout. Um, should be a lot of fun. Student section showed up in a big way last week for an FCS opponent. Students always seem to do really well with these six thirty, you know, seven o'clock kicks, which is understandable. And if you can create a raucous crowd and feed that energy into TCU, mess with UCF and their communication, mess with them and their rhythms on both sides of the ball, that will be big. And UCF has struggled on the road recently, especially against Power Four conference teams like TCU. So they have a lot to prove, even with the good early returns that they've put out with this team, which have been against you know New Hampshire and Sam Houston State so far, and both games have been at home. Um, Dishman, I think is a UCF fan, said, don't forget about the 6'11", 330 right tackle from Germany, Paul Rublet. Uh, and I think that's who Adam was talking about earlier. He said 6'10", not 6'11", but either way, large human. And yeah, they're big up front. So interesting test for this TCU defense. Now, one thing I'm curious about, TCU's edge rushers, very athletic. So can they use that speed to get around that, the, you know, the shoulder of the tackle dip that shoulder and either force those guys on the outside to hold or just, you know, get right past them and get to KJ Jefferson. And you want to do that obviously while you're keeping contained in that rush lane so that KJ is not taking off and, uh, you know, making plays off schedule and making things happen with his legs, which is something that he can certainly do. So, you know, big chess masters there and just kind of mono a mono guys going at it in the trenches. And then Transport Man says, if this game was in the bounce house, I'd be pretty worried. Even at home, it's very touch and go. He says, UCF is actually really good, and he thinks they'll surprise a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I've, I feel like I've given them a proper amount of respect this week. I do think TCU wins this ball game, and I'll get into a, a more robust prediction tomorrow. I wouldn't be shocked if it's a one-score game. I'm hopeful that the Frogs can kind of pull away, obviously, and not make it super stressful. But I think UCF's a good team, and they have a clear identity, and that's helpful, especially early in the season. But I like what I've seen from this defense. And I know it's early in the season and they haven't really been tested yet. But still, that ability to slow down this run game and force UCF to throw and the ability to stack the box because you feel comfortable with these corners. So far, they've done a great job in those press man situations, being able to reroute guys, stay with them, be physical. And uh, I have belief in, in JT Barrett and um, Lamarian James. So. One more show tomorrow to get you ready, and then don't forget live post game show after the game on Saturday. It's uh, locked on Horn Frogs, your team every day, and we're free and available wherever it is you get those podcasts.